I'd like to introduce tonight's speaker, uh, Dr. Mario Mata. Uh, Dr. Mata has ha long been active in organized medicine, both in the American Medical Association and in the Massachusetts Medical Society, holding a number of posts throughout the years. He's a past president of the MMS and was elected to the AMA Council of Science and Public Health, where he has served eight years and elected to the Board of Trustees of the AMA in 2018, recently completing his term. He also served on the board of International Dark Sky Association. Um, he has worked on light pollution issues and published several white papers on light pollution as a member of the AMA Council of Science and Public Health. He served on a UN committee, uh, Copuis, did I pronounce that per correctly? I hope I did, okay. Um, representing the AMA on light pollution for a worldwide effort to control light pollution and satellite proliferation. Dr. Mata has been in practice at the North Shore Medical Center in Salem, Massachusetts since 1983, recently retiring in 2022. Congratulations on your retirement. Um, he's a graduate of Boston College with a BS in physics and biology and of Tufts Medical School. He is boarded in and a fellow of the American College of Cardiology and the American Society of Nuclear Cardiology. He is an associate professor of medicine at Tufts University School of Medicine. Medicine. Dr. Mata also has a lifelong interest in astronomy and has hand-built a number of telescopes and observatories throughout the years to do astronomy research, including his entirely homemade 32-inch F6 relay telescope located in Gloucester, Massachusetts. He's been awarded several national awards in astronomy, including the Las Cumbres Award from the Astronomical Society of the Pacific in 2003, and also the Walter Scott Houston Award from the Northeast Section of the Astronomical League. And in 2017, the Henry Alcott Award from the American Association of Variable Star Observers. He's also served as president of the ATMs of Boston and has served as a council member of the AAVSO and is a past president as well. Um, Finally, several years ago, the International Astronomical Union award, awarded Dr. Mata an asteroid in part for his work on light pollution as well as amateur research, asteroid 133537, Mario Mata. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Mata. Dr. Mata, thank you so much for joining us tonight. I'll stop my share here and I will present the uh, podium to you. All right. That was quite an introduction. Thank you. I will... Uh... Uh, should I share now and bring please, it? Please, please do. Okay. And while you're doing that, I just wanted to remind everybody, please keep yourselves on mute. Um, we will have a Q&A coming in through the chat feature that we have in, in uh, Zoom. So if you have a question for Dr. Mata at the end of the presentation, ask that question through the chat feature. We'll get to those questions in the order that they're answered. I'll give you all an opportunity to come off of mute and ask the questions there. So thank you. All right. So you can see my screen. We can, indeed. Okay, great. So um, I'll talk about light pollution and its effects um, on uh, human health, the environment, and glare issues, um, and the AMA's recommendations, as well as the UN recommendations uh, that uh, on a committee I was involved as well. So you already went through this, so I won't leave that up. Uh, this is my home observatory. Uh, 20 foot dome, all handmade. And there's my scope. It's a 32 inch F6.5. Um, and uh, I use it quite a bit. I was up till 2.30 this morning, in fact. Here's an image of uh, uh, NGC 891 that I've taken. So that's why I'm interested in uh, light pollution. Initially, it was because I wanted to protect my sky for uh, for my observatories and my imaging. But I was a researcher early in life, um, and I got interested in the work of this man, Dr. Richard Stevens, who was the first person, he was an epidemiologist at the um, University of Connecticut, and he first brought up the issue of whether light pollution suppressing melatonin could be a reason for the increase in breast cancer in the Western world. And here is the uh, thing that piqued his interest. So if, can you see my uh, arrow pointer, right? Okay, so at that time, this is early 19, well, this is from 1999, this slide, but it was the same in 1990. Uh, when we first met, uh, he, he noticed that in North America, the rate of breast cancer is quite high. In China, it was quite low. Immigrants from China to the U.S. rapidly reached the same level of breast cancer as North America. And he reasoned it couldn't be 
air pollution or uh, general uh, toxins in the environment because China at the time was far more polluted than the United States. So he looked for other reasons. And, and then looking at multiple countries, the one thing that came clear is the greater the amount of light pollution, the greater the amount of breast cancer, which was a startling conclusion. Now, at the time, it was just a hypothesis. But since that time, many, many studies have proven him correct. Till now, I don't think it's in uh, any question at all. So numerous people have worked on this. Here's a paper by uh, the Fauci, uh, Fabio Fauci, who's uh, showing that uh, lamps with strong blue emission uh, and white LEDs uh, typically cause the most problem. And 60% uh, of the world population currently nowadays lives under light polluted skies. So this is a worldwide problem, much greater, of course, in the Western world. I don't have to tell this group, but this is what light pollution looks like from a satellite. The economics of global light pollution are quite startling. We waste $7 billion annually, uh, and that's from uh, uh, 20, 2016, 2009. That was 10 years, more than 10 years ago. Uh, it, it's great, much greater now. And that's just the light that we let escape, not the amount that we spend on electricity for lights on the ground. Uh, the uh, uh, all this can be captured and we wouldn't have to waste so much if we just directed the light down and not allow it to go up into space showing uh, showing up in satellites like the last uh, picture. I thought I'd include a satellite photo of Texas since that's the crowd I'm speaking to. Um, Houston, um, unfortunately, I have, hate to say, is one of the most light polluted areas in the whole universe. <laughs> Dallas isn't far behind. Um, out here, this is mostly burn off from uh, methane, but you've got your share of light pollution in Texas and you have to go out uh, pretty far now to be able to see a good dark sky. So light pollution affects human health. It interferes with circadian rhythms. That That's unquestioned now. In fact, the, um, the UN uh, declared light pollution, a carcinogen as far back as 2009, based on studies in the 2000s. Melatonin suppression in, uh, inhibits the immune system because melatonin is an adjunct to the immune system. So there are many endocrine related carcinomas because of that, been proven in breast, prostate, thyroid and pancreatic cancers. Now, colorectal cancer is still questionable, but there are hints that it may be affecting that as well. So there is, uh, it, because it's not so surprising that it affects sleep, mood, and depression, obesity increases uh, with light pollution, and it's consequent diabetes, an increase in coronary events. Um, so there's a, a wide range of human health effects. Then you have glare into the roadways that creates dangerous conditions for drivers and pedestrians. And then we have the, the loss of our not natural environment, which contributes to a loss of connection to nature and environmental damage. So we'll go through those uh, in a bit of detail. Uh, here's the hormone, uh, melatonin. It's a very primitive hormone. It's present even in amoeba. Uh, so even amoeba make uh, melatonin and essentially every animal on earth uh, makes melatonin. Some use it for biorhythm like humans, others use it for other reasons, but it's a very primitive hormone that's been around uh, for more than uh, 500 million years in just about every animal. But in humans, at least, uh, it induces a strong daily rhythm. It's produced by the pineal gland primarily. Some is produced by the gut. Um, it causes, uh, it, it's if it's suppressed, it changes mood and increases depression and it helps uh, fight breast cancer. So we'll talk about that in uh, more detail. And the main reason why melatonin uh, causes these problems if it's suppressed is because it modulates uh, our immune system. So over here on the right, it's known as an immunomodulation uh, uh, hormone. And by that, I mean, 
Uh, it helps T cells, which are killer cells uh, in our body, and B cell activity, which uh, are the identifier cells that go out and spot abnormal cells, and then monocytes help and T killer cells help kill that. Uh, so the if your melatonin is, it's not that light directly causes cancer. Uh, no one's saying that, but if you suppress your melatonin, then the um, uh, your immune system doesn't work quite as well. All of us produce cancer cells every single day, okay? Because we uh, multiply and produce new cells daily. And it's not surprising, a few of those may not divide properly and a few of those may become cancerous. However, if you have a good immune system, you kill, you recognize and kill those off. So it's no stretch of the imagination to imagine that if you diminish the immune system in any way, then a few of those abnormal cells are more likely to escape detection and eventually grow and become a cancer. And that's one of the reasons why older people tend to have more cancers because their immune system tends to decline with age. So it all fits if you think about it and it's actually not that difficult a concept to, uh, to grasp. So this is no longer in question. In fact, in 2017, the Nobel Prize for Medicine went to Hall, Rosbash, and Young uh, because of their work in identifying the uh, biochemical pathways of melatonin. And this is based on their work. I'm not going to go through this. I just want you to know that this is well-established, uh, well uh, uh, written up uh, and known. Uh, and again, the... Uh, uh, the, the Nobel Prize Committee thought it was important enough to give a prize for that. So some studies have been difficult to understand because there's a natural variation in sensitivity. Uh, and, and that's not surprising. We all have different responses to different stimuli. So there are high sensitivity people to light pollution and there are low sensitivity. Most lie in the middle. And this is from Phillips uh, from 2017. So what, what's the issue uh, nowadays? We've always known that light pollution can cause a problem, but nowadays it's more acute. First of all, there's no such thing as a white LED. If anyone in the audience knows how to make one, I guarantee you a billion dollars the next day because companies will be clamoring for it. The, the way we make a white LED <clears throat> is you get a blue LED and you coat it with phosphors. The phosphors then take the high energy from the blue and absorb it and then re-emit it at lower energy in the yellows, reds, uh, and greens. <clears throat> and that's how you get a white LED by covering the entire spectrum. The problem is the phosphors don't completely capture all of the blue. And consequently, a lot of blue escapes through the phosphors. And that's the problem because blue light suppresses melatonin 10 times more than red light. So if you have a 5,000 K LED, a huge amount of that is blue, 65%. Um, if you're uh, in the 2,700 range, uh, it's more like 17%. Uh, 3,000, which is a common LED light, is generally in the 20, 21% blue. That's still a lot of blue. The uh, people in Quebec and Canada have got the right idea. They produce amber LEDs, zero blue. And that's actually the ideal solution, but no US company is making those as of yet. I've been in Sherbrooke, uh, Canada, and it's, it's a very pleasing light, doesn't hurt the eye, we should adopt that. But we'll deal with what we have here. So each one of these in isolation will look white to you uh, if seen on a street. This will look intensely bright white and kind of hurt your eye. And this is uh, the best light right now. When the AMA did its recommendation for 3000K, we specifically said in 2016, 3000K or lower. And every company seems to forget the or lower. We were anticipating future advances. The, the advances are here. Nowadays, if we were writing this, we'd say 2,700. In fact, Massachusetts Medical Society has recently adopted 2,700K as the advised light. 
And there are lights out there you now can get for street lights as low as 2,400. Don't forget the high pressure sodium we've all been used to. Those are 1,800. So here's the problem. This is the light we want, this hump. But here is the light we get, a lot of blue. And if you're at 5,000 K or 3,000 uh, K, I'm sorry, uh, 4,000 K, you get a lot of blue light leaking through the phosphorus. Once you get down to 3,000 K or lower, the amount of blue is suppressed, which is why you should go with 3,000 K or lower. And the reason is blue light uh, stimulates the pineal gland to one, wake us up, but two, suppress melatonin. And that's through a new um, a, uh, cone in the eye uh, that was not discovered until 2003. We all know that we have red, blue, and green receptors. And through that, we have our color vision. And then we have a night vision receptor, which is uh, black and white. But we have this other receptor that is peaks at 4,500 uh, nanometers. And uh, it only, it, it's not used in vision. Its only purpose is to depress melatonin production in the pineal gland. Um, this is another image of mine, M81. I know this is an astronomy club, right? So I have to throw in a few astro photos. So let's talk about glare uh, as a problem. The human pupil, at least when you're young, can dilate up to seven millimeters. When you're older like me, probably only goes to five or six uh, millimeters. And that's when you're dark adapted. When you're faced with glare in a bright, intense light, that pupil will constrict down to one millimeter. And that's important to note. So if you have direct light that's unshielded into your eye, your pupil constricts. And then you only can see the light and everything else looks dark. And that's the main concept of, of a glare problem. So light will come in through the cornea, go through the lens and gets focused and then goes to the back of the eye, uh, where if you don't need to wear glasses, focuses right on the retina. Here's a human eye in uh, cut uh, in half, and you can see the lens, the cornea, and the uh, retina on the back and filled with aqueous humor. So the problem is we have a design flaw. As we get older, we have calcifications that develop in the lens. And part of the problem is that in order to be able to see, there are no blood cells that go into the lens. Okay, so what happens is as you get older, uh, this can, the lens continues to grow. New cells are laid on the surface and those cells get their nutrients through the aqueous humor, I'm sorry, the vitreous humor in the back um, and get their oxygen and uh, sugars that they need in order to stay alive. Once the lens gets thick enough, and that's generally in your 40s and 50s, the central part does not get adequate nutrition or oxygen. Those cells start to die. When a, a cell dies, it calcifies, uh, and then when it counts, those are microcalcifications. Now you have a uh, scatter when light goes through that lens off these calcifications and blue light scatters more than red light. Eventually in your 70s and 80s, this will coalesce and you have a cataract that you need removed. So if you're young and healthy and you have an intense bright source, you get scatter, but you can still see. But this is what a 70 year old eye will see. Basically, you have disability glare, which is why it's more dangerous for older people to drive at night. But it's not their fault. I tell people all the time, the reason you can't drive at night is not your bad eyes. It's because we have bad engineers who design bad lights. It doesn't have to be that way. So here is from uh, uh, the Netherlands. Uh, why didn't I put his name down? I, I apologize that I didn't put the name down and I'm blocking my mind who did this study. But when you're um, in your 20s, you know, it takes uh, 1800 uh, millilamberts to cause disability glare. By the time you're 70, it's a third of that. That's why older people have more trouble. And it's worse than that with blue light. Now, this is a log scale, but these are human eyes that were studied in the Netherlands, uh, taken from cadavers. 
And just like with the sunset, you have red light penetrate and blue scatters, same thing in the human eye. So blue scatters more and red scatters least. So if you have a situation where you have a 4,000 K light, you have intense scatters, 40% blue in the eye, and basically you're blinded. Whereas the warmer colors don't do that as much, although all light can scatter in the eye, which is why all light should be shielded properly. Uh, if you wanna do a little experiment, Take the lampshade off uh, one of your lamps in a house and see if you like it. Most people don't. That's why we have lampshades. Same thing should occur on street lights. So if you have an unshielded light, you're blinded. And uh, and if you have it, it's basically like having a dirty windshield, where shielded lighting uh, is much safer. And here's a, a great example uh, from uh, Florida. If you you can't see that there's a person there, but if you shield the light, now you can see. Another example that I took from my trip to Quebec uh, for a talk, uh, kindly given to me. So many intersections, uh, this is the beginning of an intersection in Quebec, uh, have unshielded, whoops, sorry, have unshielded lights. And what happens is if you're driving along, I don't know why that's advancing on sound, right? Uh, if you're driving along, because of this, you're blinded as to anything down the road. So there could be a deer, an auto accident, or a person standing in the road. You wouldn't know until you hit them. And again, that's not your eyes. It's bad engineering. This should be shielded, and you'd be able to see down the road much better. We shouldn't allow that in our public roadways. It's worse with... Um, LED lights because they're intense pinpoint lights. And uh, in fact, in France, they've basically mandated that these be shielded. I wish the US would do that. And when they're blue, it causes intense uh, disability glare. In my hometown of Gloucester, I was in a town council uh, uh, 14 years ago. We were one of the first adopters. Um, and notice this is 19 watt LED. We were replacing 60 watt high pressure sodium. Everyone's got to remember when you talk to your city councilors that there's a four to one ratio. So a 60 watt high pressure sodium is the, to get the same lumens, you want a 15 watt LED because of the four to one ratio. Unfortunately, far too many city councils think, well, and lighting companies, uh, are complicit in this. If you replace it at 60 watt, well, we'll give you a 50 watt. Okay, now you have four times as much light as you started with. It doesn't matter what the color correlated temperature is, whether it's um, 3000 K or 2700 K, if it's way over lit, it's way over lit. Okay, so you got to demand that you have proper lighting and not over lighting. So here on the left is uh, it, a street that was uh, lit up on shielded lights. And then when switched to LEDs, proper lighting with shielding, you can see much better on the right than you can on the left. And that's with the same exposure on the camera. Which would you rather drive down or walk? I picked this one. In Gloucester, one way to convince uh, city councilors and uh, uh, police departments I actually asked for a list of intersections with the most accidents. It was, here's the winner in Gloucester. This is a church, St. Anne's Church near the center of town. And here's school by the church. And they had this quote, uh, blaster security light up on top of the building. Now, you could have an army ransacking the building. You'd never know it because of the glare. There is one light pole here that's supposed to be lighting up the street. It never turns on because the light sensor thinks it's daylight all the time. So you have no proper lighting and the uh, the glare uh, basically drives, uh, uh, causes glare and uh, causes accidents. So it's no surprise that over a five year span, there were 19 accidents in this intersection. It took this to convince the city council. This is why you're getting so many accidents here. We convinced the school to take that down and put up a, um, a shielded light. Accident rate went way down. IES, uh, Ron Gibbons uh, from uh, Virginia Tech, did a study some years back. 
uh, where he showed his high pressure sodium and 3,500K LED um, and uh, 6,000K LED. Notice you could see better down the road with the 3000 K LED than you can with the 6000. That's because of all the glare uh, that comes from these high intensity lights. Here's another uh, latest study that showed basically the same thing. So you'll hear a lot from uh, some lighting companies. Well, we need the 5000 K so you can see color better. And that's complete balderdash. The red is 1800, which is your high pressure sodium. And yeah, there's some color rendition problems with that. But up here you have 5,000, 4,000 and 3,000 K lighting. There is essentially no statistical difference in the color rendition with any of those. You don't need 5,000 K to see uh, color at night. I'm not even sure you need color at all. Again, we lived with 1,800 K for 30 years without any problem. So some myths about the lighting. More light means security. Well, criminals need light too. Multiple studies have shown that school systems, they get uh, vandalized. A uh, simple way to do it is to turn off the lights and put motion sensors because Teenagers are like moths. They go where the lights are. You turn off the lights, they don't congregate there, and you don't have a vandalism. And you have uh, multiple studies that have shown that there's no difference between lots of lights and low light uh, to prevent crime. There are studies out there that purport to show the opposite. Whenever you see a study, look who funded it and who did the study. Almost all, every study that I've seen that shows, oh, you need more lights, are always funded by a lighting company to sell their product. I've yet to find exceptions to that rule. So you got to find studies that are independent. So here's a study, 2018, um, and they showed um, that crime rates with respect to LED intensity is 0.1. So a 1% increase in the intensity of LEDs corresponds to an increase in property crime rates, not a decrease. Then there's the famous Chicago Alley Lighting Project. Okay, so Chicago got a grant to light up all their alleyways because there was crime in the alleyways, supposedly. And they uh, ran out of money uh, about two thirds of the way through. So they had this two thirds alleyways lit up, one third not lit up. So uh, University of Chicago and uh, this group here decided that would be a perfect study to prove how well the, uh, this program worked. So <laughs> unfortunately for them, uh, after they changed all the alleyways, so 250 watts, by the way, high, huge lighting, um, they, they had feeling of safety, but the actual result, every place they lit up better, had the uh, crime rate uh, increase and the places that were left dark actually decreased because the criminals went to where they could see better. That's a landmark study, by the way. It, it's exactly, they, they went in with a bias thinking the opposite and proved that they were wrong. Street lighting may enable rather than hinder crime. And in general quantitative uh, criminology, this is a legit study. And it shows that uh, there is no evidence that increased lighting uh, causes increased crime. Decreased lighting causes increased crime. So reduced lighting in uh, England and Wales show the evidence of harmful effects of switching off our roadway collisions of crime in England and Wales. Despite 14 years of data uh, on road traffic collisions, they found no convincing evidence for association between street lighting and road traffic collisions, none whatsoever. In fact, here's some of their conclusions. If anything, uh, when they switched the lights off, there was a slight movement to less uh, traffic uh, collisions and uh, part-time light, meaning they turned it off after midnight. Uh, there was one town that increased, but most of them decreased. Crime, basically not significant either way. And part-time lighting, again, not significant either way. So lighting does not change crime rates or accident rates. Um, in fact, brighter streetlights cause more accidents. Another study here from 2020. 
street lighting, road safety, Royal Society prevention of accidents, no evidence for association of reduced lighting and collisions. Now, the same thing is there are other reasons to not use the 4,000K uh, lights. Queens, New York, or early in the, uh, tw around 2012, Queens decided they were going to put up 4,000K lighting. They're awful. Just look at these. Until you live next to 4,000K lights, you don't realize how bad they are. So people complained endlessly. Uh, this is what someone's bedroom uh, looked like. Uh, and you just can't keep this light out. It only takes a little bit of light to suppress your melatonin. So eventually they stopped the project and switched to 3000K. Now, again, New York City is one of the most light polluted areas in the universe. Even there, they don't like the 4000K lights. Since then, uh, many cities now require 3000K or lower. Some cities that were early adopters like Seattle and Pittsburgh that put up 4,000K lights in the last two years voted to take them all down. And the reason is the townspeople hate them. So what I tell people all the time is, don't be foolish. Don't put up lights that others hate and want to take down. They'll cost you double because the only way to get rid of them, take them down, they last forever. So this is what 3000K lights looks like. It's very pleasant. It doesn't hurt the eyes, especially if it's shielded. And some cities, act, Monterey actually sued their own city when they went against their recommendation over lights. Davis actually raised the tax rate to get rid of the 4000K lights. When's the last time you heard that? That's how much 4000K lights are hated. Here's a Shopping center not too far from me. They have 3,000 K lights. I'm sorry, this is 2,700. You can see the colors perfectly fine and it's pleasant lighting. Now, here's another thing I hear engineers uh, misquote a lot. They'll say, well, 4,000 K is the color of the moon. So what are you complaining about? And I've actually heard that when I've spoken to uh, engineering groups. And I, that's why I include this slide, because you may hear this all the time. So this blue line is a spectrum of the moon. The red line is 2,200. The, the black line is 4,000. Notice this spike here. That's the blue that penetrates. That's not found in moonlight. OK, and that's why I include that on my slides. So I don't have an engineer saying, but the moon. And I say, yes, what about the moon? Here is, here's what proves you wrong immediately. So there's an economic impact. We waste lots of energy by uh, lighting up things we don't need to and by lighting up the sky. Um, typical city-owned LED light, this is how much it costs to maintain and run. Light pollution equals air pollution. I know in Texas, you're still using a lot of fossil fuel. Well, this is how much you're contributing to global warming when you do. So to put it another way, a 100 watt incandescent light uh, all night long for one year is a half ton of coal. Let that sink in. Okay, here's my view of the uh, Triffid. All right, so the IARC uh, back in 2009 claimed, uh, uh, stated that uh, melatonin suppression is a probable carcinogen to humans. Mind you, here's what it takes to uh, declare that. And cigarette smoke is in the same category, Grace uh, uh, Group 2A. Okay. So because of that, in 2009, uh, I was able to get some resolutions passed through the AMA. First was simple, shielded lights. That's kind of a no-brainer. No light should be unshielded. That's been AMA policy since 2009. That's what we recommend. 2012, when I was on the Council of Science and Public Health, um, light pollution was becoming a real problem, and we're starting to switch to LEDs. And I've been reading all these reports about light pollution. I invited some of the uh, country's best uh, researchers, uh, Gibbons, uh, Brainerd, Lockley, Stevens, and myself. We and I was—I'll admit that I was mostly a uh, editor here. Uh, these were the real researchers. But we produced this paper. It has 134 peer-reviewed references. So every word in it is proven by a peer-reviewed paper. You can't get anything through the AMA because I tried 
uh, unless it's peer reviewed. And even then we had to go to, uh, had to go through several universities to, to check us for accuracy. So this is probably one of the most studied papers in history and it passed unanimously through the AMA. And basically it suggested that we cut blue emission. A very simple thing. But that was ignored. The IES, which recommends lighting for the country, basically ignored that. And lighting companies like uh, Siemens uh, were basically buying up tons and tons of 4,000K lights from China, shipping them over here, and wanting to kill the market by going to city councils and saying, uh, we'll give you these lights, you'll, you'll save energy, and you'll have better lighting, uh, just give us the contract. So. Because by 2016, it was clear that cities weren't getting a message and, uh, and uh, companies uh, were doing the wrong thing. So came up with a paper in 2016 specifically designed about LED lighting. And basically, uh, it's a 36-page paper and it has, I think, 40 uh, references. But we encouraged 3,000 K or lower. The only reason it's 3,000 K is 2016. That was the best we had back then. But we didn't want uh, cities to use 4,000 K. Uh, and University uh, Chicago uh, City Council, because the AMA is based there, took note of that, did their own study for three months. They were about to sign one of those contracts with Siemens, a $1 billion uh, contract to switch out every light in Chicago to LEDs. They, this came out, uh, someone gave it to the city council, it wasn't me. They read it and said, well, maybe we should look into this. They did their own study, agreed with the AMA report, canceled the contract with Siemens, which they didn't sign yet, and asked for uh, new contracts for only 3,000 K, which Siemens didn't have. To this day, if you mention my name to Siemens, uh, uh, you will get a very nasty rebuke uh, with my name because they feel they I cost them a billion dollar contract. So let's talk about uh, blue light. Blue light suppresses melatonin the most. Um, shortly after the uh, 2012 report, by the way, that's when iPhone started dimming the night lighting and then most uh, phones now and uh, computers now do that. And that's all because of that report, I'm happy to say. Uh, how am I doing? 8.40, okay. I got till nine, right? Take as long as you'd like, Dr. Mata. Okay. So here's a picture of one of my favorite galaxies, M51. So then I was uh, invited to be part of the UN Dark and Quiet Skies, uh, which was supposed to occur in La Palma. Unfortunately, uh, uh, COVID came around. And then the following year, we were going to have a follow-up meeting in La Palma. The... Uh, uh, the volcano erupted. So <laughs> I feel like I was cheated, but we still got our work done. So here is the recommendations from uh, the UN Advisory Committee, which is in front of the UN now, and hopefully will lead to a uh, uh, international treaty. So it was primarily for astronomical observatories, satellite constellations, damn Elon Musk, uh, and protection of radio astronomy. But there was a section on light pollution in the bioenvironment, and that's the part I was involved with. And we basically, everything I say is part of the UN's recommendation uh, in front of the UN now. Hopefully that'll be an international treaty. The uh, Europeans are getting way ahead of us, by the way. There are countries in Europe that now ban 4,000K and demand shield and like the Czech Republic. Uh, here's all the people in the UN that were, I mean, in the uh, around the world that were involved with this effort. And now this is the group that was involved with lighting. So circadian clock and clock control genes. 10% of our genes are clock contr uh, control our biorhythm. Okay, so it's not surprising that if you screw up our bio clock, you're going to have some problems if one out of every 10 genes is controlled by the bio clock. So the most obvious is sleep. Uh, if you have light leaking through your windows, you tend to get less sleep. And that leads to, uh, it turns out, obesity, uh, increase in diabetes, uh, psychiatric issues, bipolar disease, all that's been shown already. So then there's a theory that light at night alters hormones and increase the high risk in industrial societies. Initially, it was a hypothesis. Now it's pretty well proven. So the, the uh, 
shift work is the hypothesis initially in 1990 was shift workers should be at higher risk. That's been proven. Blind women should be at lower risk, including twins. That's been proven. I'll show you one study. Lighted bedrooms at night increase risk, including if the light goes through the shades from uh, street lights. Long sleep lowers risk. That's been proven. So here is breast cancer in sighted women compared to blind women. Believe it or not, they scoured the world this is, uh, and found twins. One woman is can see and the other one is blind. And in the uh, United States, uh, the one who can see has 1.7 times the risk of getting breast cancer than her twin sister who does not see. And that's consistent in Norway, Finland, and Sweden. It was a Swedish originated study. So that's kind of proven now. And that multiple studies have also shown that since then. Early on, uh, my group of researchers uh, put in a paper for Cancer Journal. Uh, it was one of the first papers in uh, light pollution in the journal Cancer. And I'm not a, an oncologist, I'm a cardiologist. Uh, but since then, many, many studies have been done. Uh, I'm going to list some of the studies, not because it's a medical talk, but I want to demonstrate that this is not hearsay. It's not pie in the sky. This is proven research now, and it shouldn't be questioned. And I'll give you uh, some studies to show that. So light pollution and cancer. Um, clinical studies demonstrate a significant association between artificial light at night and breast cancer and a moderate uh, relationship in other cancers as well. This is in 2020, and this is multiple cancers that have been looked at. You know, that was a, uh, uh, then there's melatonin, how it buffers the immune system. This paper supports the idea that melatonin as an immune buffer acts as a stimulant on, uh, to, for conditions of anti-inflammatory and uh, immune responses such as acute inflammation. And uh, so melatonin is important. If you suppress it, you're gonna have bad medical effects. This is uh, again, uh, 2013. Melatonin immune function and age, it's more important as you age because your immune system is already on the, on the decline, and melatonin stimulates the, the production of granulocytes and macrophages. So if your melatonin is suppressed, you're going to have a problem in higher rates of cancers and uh, difficulties. Melatonin on the immune system in cancer, uh, Journal Cancer and Clinical Research 2015, melatonin elicits oncostatic properties in a variety of different tumor cells. Number of studies have documented the melatonin given in combination with chemotherapy to patients with disseminated disease increases the overall survival and reduces toxic side effects. So if you have a cancer, it's important to make sure your melatonin stays uh, healthy. It improves the, uh, uh, the uh, tumor uh, fighting uh, 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 toxins that are given. So light at night and breast cancer is a, a systematic review, meta-analysis, and basically demonstrates, I think they reviewed uh, 17 studies uh, through 2021. All of them showed that there is a linear relationship between excess light at night and cancers. Outdoor light night uh, and breast cancer in black and white women in Southern Community Code study. It's even more important in, in black women, it turns out. So here's one of my favorite studies, mainly because it was right out of here at Harvard and I had some uh, mild input into it. Uh, this was followed 110,000 women from 1989 to 2013. Uh, and uh, these women were divided up into uh, five quintiles. Uh, based on their uh, zip code, uh, the lowest quintile was in a more rural area. The highest quintile was in Central City and everything in between. Well, and, and then they correlated that with uh, satellite photos showing in that um, uh, zip code how much light pollution there is. Uh, and uh, it turns out the difference between the lowest light polluted area and the highest, there was a 14% increase in breast cancer. Okay, and that's a lot of women. So this is a pretty good and well-documented study. And they took into account every other factor that they could, by the way. Um, now, 
don't get me wrong, 40% of breast cancers are by the BRAC gene, and there are other factors as well. But a 14% increase for the rest is quite significant. Now, if you think this is just one study, here are, there are 20 other studies that reproduce that study. Best one is from Spain. Uh, there's one from uh, International Cancer. It's a, uh, this was, well, let me see. Uh, there's one from Spain, there's one from Israel, um, one did try to do a worldwide study, South Korea, one uh, specifically to Connecticut. So 20 studies have reproduced that study. When you have 20 studies that all show the exact same thing, you can't dis dispute it anymore. One of my favorite studies goes back to 2003 by uh, Dr. Blask at Tulane. Uh, he's a great researcher, and he's a basic researcher. He took 120 nude mice. Nude mice take uh, they have bread mice that allow transplants. So what he did is he transplanted uh, human breast cancer under the skin of these uh, rats and then subjected them to a normal daylight cycle or increase in amounts of light until they, there was light on all night long at full intensity. And lo and behold, what did he found? At 30 days, uh, the ones that had a normal day to light night had this steady rate of, of cancer growth that was implanted. A little bit of light, this is minimal, uh, 0.02 watts per square centimeter. That's the amount of light that goes through your shades at night if you live in a city. They had this rate of breast cancer growth a little bit more light, higher rates, until finally, if you kept the lights on all night long, uh, the poor little rats, the, uh, the the tumors basically exploded out of their chest. So you can't do this experiment on humans, you have to do it on rats. But I think this is pretty indicative of what can happen. So there are other cancers. I know Dr. Zhao is in the audience, so I picked her studies to highlight. Uh, but uh, right there in Texas, you have a great researcher who's highlighted increase in pancreatic cancer um, in, uh, in the NIH diet and health study. Okay, and, and also is correlated with light at night from satellites followed for 16 years. They also divide it up into quintiles. So a 27% increase, that's pretty significant. Artificial light and thyroid cancer, also, Dr. Zhao was in this, I believe. Anyways, uh, it showed thyroid cancer increases as well. Outdoor light at night and obesity uh, in the NIH diet and health study, increase obesity increases. And whenever you have an increase in obesity, you have an increase in coronary disease and diabetes. Okay, I'm a cardiologist, so this study um, I've looked at, it's from the Europeans, 2021 European Heart Study. Uh, indoor light pollution, in, uh, I haven't seen one for outdoors yet for carotid atherosclerosis, but if you keep the lights on, you're gonna, you have a higher rate of atherosclerosis and strokes later in life. White light emitting on retinal pigment. So let's talk about something totally different. Um, high intensity light and blue light damages the retina. And if you're exposed to that on a regular basis, uh, you can you have retinal damage. Multiple studies have shown that, and it increases the amount of age-related macular degeneration. So that's another reason to cut down the blue, because blue increases the rate of macular degeneration and uh, the rate of, of uh, retinal damage much more than red. Possible. Uh, here's another study showing the same thing, different wavelengths, but uh, blue is the worst. Uh, this is NGC 6781. It's a very nice planetary nebula. So constant exposure to different wavelengths of light. Uh, this is in the journal I. Again, excess light, excess blue, and you end up with worse uh, retinal damage later in life. I must have gone the wrong way, sorry. Environmental impacts of land. Um, I won't spend much time on this. I was getting short anyways, but I just thought I'd <clears throat> point out that humans are one species on Earth. Every species on Earth is affected. Uh, one of the best uh, uh, researchers is from California, Travis Longcourt, the University of uh, California, Southern California. And he's documented multiple studies 
that have shown many different species uh, get uh, affected. And in fact, in Nature 2018, I love this quote, I use it a lot. If a lighting environment effect on a particular species has not been documented, it's probably because it has not yet been studied. In every case where a study has been performed, an effect has been determined. I can't think of a stronger statement. Basically, he's saying that if, if you don't know of a species that's been affected by lights, because no one's studied it yet, every time he studies it, there is an effect. So light pollution uh, uh, can affect animals, uh, uh, different species, insects, and artificial lighting uh, uh, affects our, our general environment. So there are many studies, mammals, it changes the time of birth. Fishes reduces follicle stimulating and luteinizing hormone. Birds, 0.3 lux, which isn't a lot, can move the reproductive seasonality of songbirds by a month and interfere with their mating. Insects reduce pheromone, that should be pheromone, quality and quantity in moths. Plants, early bud bursts unrelated to temperature and then they die. So here's the problem with the high blue LEDs. This is from 50 miles away, uh, the 4,000K, 3,500K, and 5,000K uh, spread horizontally much more than the, um, uh, the warmer wavelengths. Light pollution is a driver of insect uh, declines. So this is by Owens. Insects around the world are rapidly declining. And we're in fact, many uh, entomologists are calling it an insect apocalypse. Right now, there are 40% less insects worldwide than there were 30 years ago. Let that sink in. We're, we're essentially creating an extinction event. Now, some of that's due to insecticides, no question. A lot of it's due to lights because many of the good insects we don't want to kill are also being killed. In fact, I, there was a lecture I attended a few years ago, and I love the title, Why Is Your Windshield Clean? I remember as a teenager driving, and insects were always splatting on my windshield. Hardly ever happens anymore. We've already killed them all off is the reason why your windshields are staying clean. Insect declines, uh, this light pollution matter. As you kill off the insects, it causes a decrease in pollination uh, and uh, decreases agriculture as well because of that. It's no great shakes to understand why so many uh, communities need to now bus a truck in bees in order to pollinate their plants because we're killing off all the local insects. This is an extreme example, but this is over the Susquehanna River. Mayflies, they should be going along the river mating, instead they attracted the light and just dying in place. Okay, all these are fish food that are no longer food for the fish, which are now starving. We're killing off insects, I mean, uh, birds at an alarming rate uh, because of light pollution. Turtles in Florida, uh, I don't know if you remember 25 years ago, everyone thought the turtles were dying off because of local uh, toxins and pollution. Well, took a researcher from Atlantic University in Florida, and he realized, no, it's the lights. Everyone in Florida loves to, for some reason, put on their lights and shine up the beach and the waves come in, even when they're in bed. Turtles hatch at night and go by the moonlight to go out to sea. If they have bright lights, instead of going out to sea, they go out to the street and they don't make it to the sea and die. So, they did pass a law in Florida, one of the few environmental laws actually got passed, uh, but now you can't shine your lights on on the light all night long, and the turtle population, behold, is coming back. Um, the, uh, the fireflies used to be very common. They're getting rare, except in rural areas. If the female and male fly can't see each other because of light pollution, they don't mate, you have no baby fireflies. Here's one of my favorite examples. This is in Northern California. Uh, there is a bridge that goes across a river. This is near the Oregon border. And some bright soul, excuse the pond, decided it would be great to light up underneath the bridge this way from 10 miles away. You can see it, even though it has nothing to do with safety on crossing the bridge. So they put up these lights, 4,000K, lighting up the water. 
salmon used to run up here. Turns out salmon don't like the bright light and they stop right here and basically don't run upstream. And uh, it took them five years to figure it out until uh, when the LEDs got a few years, uh, the basically the salmon run, they basically white, got them wiped out. They finally turned them off for two months while they're running and the salmon population is coming back. So if you, every species is affected, even the ones you wouldn't think about. Um, reduced melatonin in songbirds and uh, affects them as well. Human food pollination is being affected. Uh, we need pollinators for 75% of our food. And then here's one that you wouldn't expect. We've all heard about algae blooms in Florida. Now, most of the algae blooms because of runoff from agriculture. No, no question about that. But here's something that's not well known. Algae get eaten by zooplankton. The zooplankton will not come up when there's light. So they stay in the depths below 300 feet. But there's a migration every single night. Zooplankton come up and eat algae. But along the shore, when you have light pollution, the zooplankton either go somewhere else or don't come up and eat the algae, which, again, not the root cause of the algae bloom, but contributes to it. Again, things that you wouldn't think about cause environmental damage. Trees are affected. Here's a tree that's lit up uh, potway, so it thinks it's summer, fall here. Here it thinks it's winter. And when this tree is stressed this way, uh, trees die 50% faster. And here's a study from uh, Purdue University. Uh, does light at night harm trees? I won't uh, basically, uh, I, instead of putting in the conclusion, I put in the name, sorry about that. But basically the conclusion is excess lighting harms trees and they die about 50% to uh, one third faster if they're exposed to lights at night. And finally, just the aesthetics. Who would rather live here rather than here, which most of us unfortunately now do? We've lost the beauty of the night sky. And if you're in a true uh, ur uh, suburban environment, not suburban, but uh, rural, you see 6,000 stars in the sky. Most cities, you're down to 14 to 70 stars. I would rather see this than this personally. And uh, many people have never seen the Milky Way. I think that's an abuse. The uh, One of the UN uh, results was that we should save dark sky oases uh, for the beauty of it and to allow people to see the night sky. Uh, I agree with that. Uh, this is a yearly meeting, Roland, uh, from Europe, responsible outdoor lighting at night. I contribute to that. And again, the Europeans are ahead of us. The IES was fighting me for years. They finally, their last one that came out, their booklet, uh, finally agrees that blue light's not good. So here's the problem though. Most lighting engineers have no lighting degree. <laughs> this is a sorry fact. There are only five universities in the country that give a lighting degree. So many people who have other degrees and have never taken a class in lighting, will take a job as a lighting engineer. So if you really want to make a pain for yourself, uh, ask where was your degree from and what was it in? Okay, if they don't say a lighting degree, then they just picked it up like you and I did. Uh, but the IES gives them a handbook. And the second problem is if they say, well, I, I'm using the ANS IES uh, handbook, ask what year, what volume are you using? If you're not using the latest, and many of them, because this costs 250 bucks or something, and, and like most of us, you're using something that's 20 years out of date, I've embarrassed some engineers at town councils. I simply ask, which volume are you using? They said 2020, 20, 2003, something like that. I says, well, why don't you buy the latest and you'll find out that everything you just said is completely wrong. So use that in some town meetings. Is a picture of Saturn I took and NGC 4565, which is one of my favorite galaxies. And I'll stop there and answer any questions. If you go to my website, uh, the, uh, let's see, where is it? www.myramadamd.com. Uh, you have many studies that you, you can download, but these are very uh, available these days. So 
any questions I can answer. Dr. Mata, thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. It's uh, quite sobering to see just how wide ranging the effects of you know something as simple as lighting could be on on so many different ecosystems, uh, not uh, just limited to to you know our own hobby here in astronomy. So, uh, thank you for sharing that. We did have uh, a number of questions in the chat here. I'd like to get to those in order that they were presented. Uh, do you have a few minutes for those, Dr. Yeah. Mata? Okay. Yeah. Debbie Moran had the first question in the chat. Debbie, do you, do you want to come off of mute and ask your question? Or if I can remember which question that was. I think that was uh, about <laughs> yes, the I do remember. Yes. I do remember. <laughs> okay. Okay. So Steve Goldberg and I have been wondering, I mean, I've been looking for look, reading for years now, the increases of um, cancers, mostly colorectal and young adults. And I thought, well, if it has anything to do with blue light, there should be other cancers that are also coming up. And then just very recently, there was a report on a study that said, yes, there are also increases and other cancers, I looked up some of them, uterine and um, uh, pancreatic, by the way. And there's one I have no idea why. It says uh, cancer of the appendix, and I couldn't find anything about that. But several well, of the colorectal uh, is has uh, endocrine cells in them uh, because it makes hormones. And basically any hormone-related uh, organ uh, seems to be affected. But go ahead. Yeah, so the question is, is every... All of the articles I read say there may be some unknown environmental factor and not one of them mentions blue light as even being looked at. Is any is that even a possibility and is anyone looking into that? This has been five or six years, they say. Now they're looking at the gut biome, but yeah. nobody the, mentions light. The, the evidence for colorectal cancer is not as strong. There are several papers that are very suggestive, but the it's not as robust as the evidence for breast cancer um, and uh, prostate cancer, especially those two have literally hundreds and hundreds of papers. So there's really no question about those. Thyroid and pancreatic cancer is now getting more firmly established. I believe colorectal cancer, and it makes sense because it has endocrine cells, but it's just not as robust. People are now researching that. There will be papers coming out over the next five to eight years. Thank you. Right. Thank you so much for that question, Debbie. By the way, I want to give a shout out to Deborah. She is a tireless advocate, and I appreciate all your advocacy. No doubt. We are certainly lucky to have her in our community. It just uh, it may seem like there's not a lot of progress being made in Houston, but whatever progress is being made, Debbie's had a hand at a lot of that. So we do thank her for it's that. That's right. The best thing is we can use Houston as a cautionary tale like we've been in the city. It's <laughs> right. very helpful that way. The canary in the coal mine, right? Um, all right. Don Selly had the next question. Don, do you want to come off of mute and ask your question? Sure. Thank you very much, Dr. Mata. Um, the way things typically work is uh, cost savings, et cetera. We see uh, cost savings due to uh, the lower uh, uh, energy use. However, we're, we're seeing more more lights. Um, I want to talk about real really quickly the um, uh, glare glare uh, impairment. Has, have we seen any lawsuits over that? Because savings from lawsuits is a, usually a big driver on uh, getting things to change. There are some attorneys that uh, specialize in lawsuits. I don't I don't I don't like dealing with attorneys, so I don't want to get involved <laughs> with that. But um, Yes, and there are attorneys that uh, will claim it both ways. Well, there was no light at this intersection, so that's the reason there was an accident. And others that'll say, well, there was too much glare because there was a light. That's why there was an accident. They'll play it both sides, as, as lo most lawyers will. But the, 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 um, the net result is unshielded lights cause glare. Glare causes accidents. That's unquestionable based on multiple studies. And so, and here's this, and you mentioned the economics. It doesn't cost any more to make a well-designed light as opposed to a poorly designed light. The shielding is pennies to add to, of material added to the light. So you might as well get the light that doesn't cause accidents and doesn't ruin our environment. And the cost of a blue rich LED is no different nowadays than a 2,400 or 2,700 LED. So cost is completely irrelevant these days, okay? That should not be a factor. Thank you very much, Dr. Mata. 
Thanks for the question, Don. Uh, all right, the next one was Hannah Power. I, I hope I'm pronouncing your last name correctly, Power. Uh, Hannah, you had a question about uh, advocacy and what we can do to uh, work towards this pro uh, correcting this problem. Uh, if you want to come off of mute and ask your question of Dr. Mata, please feel free to do so. Hannah, I don't know if you're there, uh, but if you're not going to come off of mute, I can ask the question for you. Uh, she'd asked, what work can individuals do to work towards limiting light pollution? Are there any activist organizations you recommend for someone interested in becoming involved? Do you believe meaningful change is even possible in America? Well, if you live near Houston, call Deborah. But uh, you can <laughs> join the IDA, um, and that's a worldwide organization. I'm a past uh, uh, board member of the IDA and uh, currently member of the IDA in uh, Massachusetts. Uh, and they, they do fabulous work. Uh, it's it's a volunteer. Uh, they, they ask for $35, but it's uh, basically a donation. Uh, but that'll give you plenty of information that you need to go to a local city council. And the second thing is basically my wish list is that every city or town has at least one activist that will go to city council meetings. If we did that, uh, this problem could be solved easily because most city council members don't know anything about lighting. So they basically ask the lighting company and the lighting company, surprise, surprise, best interest is to increase their profits, not to give you the best lighting. <clears throat> yep. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, Dr. Xiao wanted to uh, mention something before she had to drop. Uh, Dr. Xiao, the floor is yours. Please feel free to uh, make the comments that you wish to make. Sure. Um, just very quickly, thank you so much for this very comprehensive talk. It's beautiful. Um, I just want to mention one thing that, um, as I said in the comment, I believe light pollution is not just the public health hazard, but also an environmental justice issue. So there have Absolutely. been some including um, one paper that we published that showed um, it's really the more disadvantaged communities and racial and ethnic minority populations that show their higher levels of light pollution. Um, so, you know, I just want to make that comment. And also those happen to be the people that has the least means to buffer the adverse effects. They don't have blackout curtains, they have to work night shift work and they, therefore they're more exposed to light as well. So um, just thank you again, I have to run now, but um, just want to make that comment. Thank you, I appreciate your papers. Thank you, Dr. Xiao, and thank you for sharing those links. Uh, for those of you who are still on, uh, those are in the uh, meeting chat. If you'd like, you can uh, go ahead and, and click on those URLs directly. That'll take you to those uh, those links that um, Dr. Xiao had mentioned. Uh, okay, uh, we had a question from Vanita Fuller. Vanita, do you want to come off of mute and ask your question? Uh, yes, I think you answered part of this after I made the input the question. I think you answered it with your studies on the rats. But could you explain the difference between dark and those gradations as the cancer risk went up? I mean, it's not like uh, if you fall asleep with television on at night, is that a risk or is yes. bright light? That is, unfortunately, but there is no dimming of blue on uh, TVs at night. So um, basically, when you're looking at your screen up until uh, sleep, your melatonin normally your melatonin starts to rise when it's dark. So if you keep your lights on, your melatonin is suppressed until you start turning off the lights. But this, but the TV especially has high intensity blue light, especially LED uh, TVs. So consequently, that's especially harmful. And if you, uh, instead of taking a sleeping pill, basically turn off the TV, read a book under a yellow light, uh, for a half hour, 45 minutes, go to bed. And by the time you're ready to go to bed, your melatonin is starting to rise and you'll fall asleep much easier. People think it's that they're falling asleep because it's uh, they're reading a book and maybe they're getting bored. Or the, but It's not. It's because you're no longer suppressing your melatonin. Once the melatonin starts to rise, you get sleepy. So let nature put you to sleep instead of us uh, pills. I tell that to my patients all the time. 
Thank you for that question, Vanita. And speaking of uh, pills, Bob Gillespie had the next question. Uh, Bob, do you want to come off of mute and ask your question? Sure. Um, the discussion has talked about melatonin quite a bit. And so an obvious question would be um, over-the-counter melatonin pills and things like that. I would assume they they do nothing to, to help. Yeah. So melatonin certainly helps you if you're suffering from um, uh, jet lag and changing uh, zones. We all know that, and it'll help you fall asleep. Um, it, it, there was one study, in fact, I included it in this uh, talk, that showed that it improves the ability to, uh, when you're getting chemotherapy, uh, to fight, uh, it improves the effectiveness of the chemotherapy by taking melatonin. But there aren't many studies on this yet, so it's not very much well known. And there are other studies where people have taken extra melatonin and it doesn't seem to cut the risk of, uh, of cancers. Uh, at least the, these were early studies 10 years ago. They haven't been repeated. Uh, so it, it's kind of a mixed bag. I can't say that if you take melatonin, you, you're better protected. But what's incontrovertible is if you allow your natural melatonin to, to flower at night, you are better protected. Whether taking pills protects you or not is not robust enough studies to say that. But I did show one study where it does improve the effectiveness of chemotherapy. All right. Thanks for the question, Bob. Dr. Mata, two more questions. Is that okay? Is that, uh, as long okay. as you want. I'm fine. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the next question was from Bill Spaziri, uh, our good friend, Bill. Uh, Bill, do you want to come off of mute and ask your question? Well, um, I think that was a long time ago. I, I, I think <laughs> I didn't have a question. I had a comment, uh, which was extremely significant to me. It was I, in the form of a question, though. <laughs> well, so, uh, okay, perhaps. I uh, hope we're talking about the same thing. Uh, many years ago, many years ago, I was a believer in helping dark skies, but I thought that the I was listening to the advocates and they seemed like fanatics to me. Please uh, don't take this in any way. That's oh, what it seemed question, like to me. <laughs> and uh, then one of those people took me outside and showed me the proper temperature lights right next to the the bright blue and white lights right next to each other. And I just, hallelujah, I became a believer instantaneously. When you see them right next to each other, the difference is striking. The problem is obvious. I even went to the Houston City Council and tried to tell them that, but, you know, what are they going to listen to me? But when you see them right next to each other, you can make a believer out of somebody is what I'm trying to say. And uh, that, that's how I, obviously, you know, I understand what you're saying. I, I agree with you completely. But that was, a, I thought, a good way to make people understand. That's it. Yeah. So I completely agree with you. And the um, uh, two things, uh, two quick comments on what you said. First of all, in Gloucester, it was hard to convince the city council because people just intuitively know, even though they have no studies to back this up, that the brighter the light, the better it is, right? That's what people think. That's why people light up their houses like crazy. So what they finally agreed to, okay, we'll do a study. We'll put up four lights uh, of uh, 4,000 4, K and four lights of 3,000 K. And they did that along the street near the center of town. And they, they published it and said, please vote uh, for when we replace our lights, which one you like. They got something like 230 votes. Everyone voted for the the 3000K. No one wanted the 4000K. And the reason is once you're exposed to, I mean, it's a number, 4000K, 3000K. What's the difference? Once you see it, you realize how bad it is. Okay. And that's why Seattle is taken down you know, all of the lights right now as we speak. It's, it's a five-year project. And the reason they're doing it is because the city people hate it. So consequently, the thing to do if you have a reluctant city council is, is say, do this experiment. Why don't you put up a few 2,700 lights, a few uh, 4,000 K lights, and let the townspeople vote. That's what convinced uh, people in town here where I live 
and uh, the it was un unanimous at the city council once the votes came in. And the second thing you said about fanatics, yes, sometimes people can be fanatics. I never tell people you have to shut off all your lights because immediately you'll get a turn off. Mm -hmm. What I say is use light appropriately. Don't place it where you don't need it. Don't interfere in your neighbor's lights and shield lights so it doesn't cause environmental harm. That I think everyone can agree to. And once you put it in those terms, you don't come across as a fanatic and you win people over. All right, Joe, I think I found what you might be referring to as my question. My question was, do the cell phone and computer companies have any comments on all this? That was the question. Yeah. <laughs> the uh, cell phones, the iPhone I have, dims automatically at 9 p.m., gets rid of all the blue. And that was bait. And Apple specifically stated because of the 2012 AMA paper. So that's you can override it if you want. But it, the uh, basically it shuts down all the blue and you can use it all night long, but without blue. All the other most of the phones now do that. Most computers do that, not all. But there are things you can download to dim your computer and get rid of blue. TVs are a whole nother matter. They have intense blue, and that's why you should shut them off an hour before you want to go to bed. All right, thanks, Bill. Um, all right, last question from Pradeep. Pradeep, do you want to come off of mute and ask your question? Okay, no, Mike, that's right. All right, his, 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 can I ask one quick question? Just yeah, quick, quick. Well, let, let's get to Pradeep's question first, and I don't. Is that Joe? Yeah, that was Joe Donald. Joe. Okay. Well, he popped up and said no mic, so I thought. Okay, okay. yeah, no worries. I, we'll, we'll get to his question because he did ask it, and then uh, we'll give the last question to you if that's okay. So Pradeep's question was, do blue light blockers work, and are they recommended? The initial section of your presentation seems to provide a solid argument in favor of their utility. He said, I've previously been skeptical of them as merely a marketing spiel or gimmick. You're talking about the, uh, I imagine, the high glasses that are blue blockers? I believe so. Yeah, and the answer is yes, they work. Uh, so you, um, in fact, I've got a pair. A company sent them to me after I gave a talk, uh, and they seem to to work. It helps me dock adapt a little faster. It's not the uh, be all end all, but yeah. it does block blue. And if you want to wear them at night to block your TV, that that might work. Although I see no study on that, yeah. so I can't recommend it. The only thing I will ever recommend is something that's proven with a study. But it makes sense that if you block the blue from a TV light, a TV screen, you have less of an effect later at night. So that's the only way I can answer it based on some common sense. Great, thank you for that. And then uh, Joe, we'll go ahead and get your question as the last one. Okay, I was just going to say if you had any other good ideas for how to convince people because I was going to make one comment. We, we tried to get a light pollution ordinance around the George Observatory and we succeeded for about 15 years and then the state legislature canceled it again. So we eventually lost, but uh, we talked a lot to city councils and such. And what we found was uh, the winning argument was to switch the argument to be about light trespass. Uh, that uh, what we found is people in rural areas, if you you tried to say we want a light pollution ordinance out in the countryside, they got mad. I want to be able to do whatever I want. But if the conversation flipped to we want an ordinance against light trespass, then everybody loved it. So I, I don't know. Is there like a collection anywhere of like all the good strategies for how to give good yeah. arguments? Well, there, there are political realities. I mean, in Gloucester, um, and, and I've worked on many others. Some some are stricter than others. Connecticut has some of the strictest slight pollution laws, uh, and that's due to uh, 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 several people who I know down there. But um, it, it's you're not. It, it's hard to get a law passed for private homes. It's very very difficult to do that. So in Gloucester, uh, the ordinance we have is covers all street lights, businesses and multi-family homes. So if you have two or more families, you're covered because you're renting out and you're basically uh, listed as a business. Uh, and it's been helpful because all development since then tends to uh, follow the bylaw. It's, it's enforced 
at the uh, when you have to put in your building plan and then your lighting plan. Uh, so because it's really hard to fix things after the fact. So but in other places, it's weaker or stronger. Connecticut does cover it's the only state that I know of covers private homes. But you are absolutely correct nuisance uh, issues such as someone shining a spotlight directly into your bedroom window. You can complain about that uh, <clears throat> even if there isn't an ordinance and just by nuisance laws, you may get that addressed. Uh, generally, the best way is to speak to that neighbor. If they don't wanna listen, then unfortunately you gotta complain elsewhere. Uh, but uh, most people are reasonable, some people are not. The, the problem in many locales is People just quote know that uh, that if they put up lights, that uh, this will help them uh, prevent crime. We won't get broken into. Yet study after study after study. The best one I, I found. I should have included that one. Is you go to study people to ask people in jail for burglaries. Why did you pick these houses? And invariably the answer is it was brightly lit. And they're basically saying, I'm paraphrasing here, they're basically saying, I'm afraid of you and I got a lot of expensive things in my house and I'm trying to scare you away. Wow. OK, so they pick the houses that look like they're rich and all lit up because those are exactly the houses that they want to hit. <laughs> and the houses that tend not to be lit up don't get hit as hard or as much or as often. And that's a well-known fact. <laughs> that's a new one. Thank you. OK, that's a good one. I love it. Appreciate that. Yeah. And just uh, anecdotally, the, the night that uh, they put the of the day that they put new LED lights on my street, uh, my neighbor had parked his Jeep right under that bright new LED light and uh, his, his Jeep was broken into that very night. So. Well, I just gave you a study on that from England that showed that yeah. it basically uh, it increased uh, break ins in, uh, into cars. Absolutely. Can I make right. a comment? Uh, I know we have a little time, but but um, I'll come. I have that slide, and then conversely, in Woodside, where we have shielded light, we have a video of someone breaking off a car burglary when a when a light came on. We had subdued light there, but um, just want to let the membership know that I really think the root cause of light pollution is uneducated police forces and having only environmentalists do this message, this message instead of the police talking about the kind of lighting that makes you see well. Seeing is believing. I found the police are incredibly easy to educate if I can get to them and just show them physically. I, we've turned them around in 60 seconds, but that's the belief, the root cause. We, they, people know that the bright light is better because that's what they hear from the police. If they hear differently from the police, we solve the problem. Absolutely. Thanks, Debbie. And uh, Dr. Mata, thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. Uh, it was very enlightening, uh, in some cases discouraging. <laughs> 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 yeah, right. No pun intended. Um, but uh, I, I, I know we've all come out of this uh, much better prepared to have these conversations with the folks in our city councils and uh, those who uh, hold the power to make some of these decisions. So thank you very much. And we'll, we will share your contact information that you had in the last slide there uh, with everybody who attended tonight. And hopefully we can uh, continue to uh, follow all of the great things that you're doing there. And, and hopefully everybody else feels more empowered to join Debbie and some of the other folks within our, our local governments to uh, within our local communities, excuse me, uh, to, to have these conversations with folks the next time uh, we have city council meetings. So thank you again, Dr. Mata. We really well, do appreciate that. Thank you for the talk. honor of addressing you. And it was my pleasure. Thank and you. The, the honor and pleasure was all ours. Thank you. Thank you.